Hello, this is Rachel Bevan from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club. This week, we have another great episode for you in our usual format. Craig Underhill gets us started this week by talking us through a Japanese paper examining primary tumor resection plus chemotherapy versus chemo alone for metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Hans Prennan gets stuck into the use of tipofarnib in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma with HRAS mutations. Tune in to our next usual format episode to find out what the H stands for. Eva Segalov continues to guide us through what she calls the manifesto for good study design. Yes, it's a mega paper from our friend Bishal Gayawali, addressing biases in study design that distort the appraisal of clinical benefit and ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale. Just a quick note on this one, Eva started her analysis of this paper in last week's episode, so I do recommend listening to episode 33 if you've not already. Today's quick bites are as diverse as ever, covering estimates for cancer incidence and death to 2040, plasma CF DNA genotyping, the CROSS trial, targeting metabolism to enhance immunotherapy, and a paper by our friend Heidi Probst on the patient experience of radiotherapy for breast cancer. If you're not familiar with Heidi, check out episode 32, When the Oncologist Gets Cancer. It's an incredibly moving episode. I hope you enjoy today's entertaining and informative episode. As ever, links to all of the papers discussed today are available in the notes on our website. If you'd like to be notified when new podcast episodes are released and to receive a free update each week covering all the latest breaking oncology news and a few quirky articles too, then sign up to our weekly publication, The Oncology Newsletter, on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is The Oncology Podcast. Everybody, g'day, g'day, g'day. G'day, g'day, g'day. Good day, good day, good day. He's almost got an Australian accent now. Hello, Hans. Hi. And g'day to you, Craig Underhill. G'day, Eva. How are you doing? Fantastic. Well, we're back. We're back with another action-packed episode of regular stuff, which means we've gone looking through the literature at things that caught our eye and we thought were important, interesting, practice changing or not, uh, good to discuss. So straight over to you, Craig. Well, I've got a sort of a, I hope, a very practical paper, Eva, and this is maybe not news to you and Hans, who are professors in GI, so I sort of hesitated to present this paper because you know, you're going to ask me some tough questions, but it's called Primary Tumor Resection Plus Chemotherapy Versus Chemotherapy Alone for Colorectal Cancer Patients with Asymptomatic but Synchronous Unresectable Metastases. It's from JCOG, the Japanese Clinical Oncology Group. So this was a randomized trial. Patients who present with a colon cancer and at the same time have unresectable Uh, metastases. And so, you know, this is a practical question. Should you go in and resect the primary and then do chemo or should you just get on with the chemo because that's what's going to probably determine their survival? So this was a study done between 2012 and 2019, 165 patients randomised, which is not a lot. And that's because at the first interim analysis, there was the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee recommended early termination of the trial because of futility. And with a medium follow-up of 22 months, there was no difference in survival. It was 25 months in the primary resection plus chemo arm and 26 months in the chemotherapy alarm own. So no difference. So this is a first time that there's been a randomized study in this field. I think most people practices probably if the primary tumor is asymptomatic, not bleeding, not about to obstruct, and people have unresectable metastases to start off with chemotherapy. Um, some centers may, you know, traditionally have gone in and resected the primary and then done chemotherapy. And really this is suggesting that there's no difference in survival 
you might as well just do chemotherapy and save people having surgery up front. So, Craig, now comes the difficult questions from Hans and I. Actually, JCOG, the Japanese groups, to be congratulated, they do fantastic trials. AGITG tried to do this some years ago and had to stop due to inability to recruit. So it's a really hard trial to recruit to. We know all the retrospective data suggests you do better if you resect the primary even if you've got metastatic disease, but there are so many biases in that. And the other plea that I'd make is you really need a good reason, I think, to operate. Bleeding is not necessarily a good reason. You'll get control very quickly with your systemic therapy. And I feel that I see all too often patients who went to surgery and never got any treatment because they were just never fit enough afterwards what's your experience hands yes in my opinion it's the only reason to go for surgery is whether you if you have obstruction and even then you can decide just to place a stoma rather than removing the primary tumor so my preference is also to start chemotherapy as soon as possible to avoid delay yeah stoma or stenting of course is available inappropriate so it's good to have this data here and a great paper to present. The other thing I point out, Eva, is there's two other studies. One completed recruitment called Synchronous and the other Cairo 4 in basically in the same group of patients. So there'll be two other studies looking at this question in the future. Fantastic. So, Hans, you're presenting in your other area of expertise, maybe, Indeed. at NEC. Head and neck, but actually it's mainly about target therapy. And also this is really a cool story. It's about tipifarnib. And I think it's something you have to remember. It was a publication in GCO, March 2021, and it's called tipifarnib and head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, which HRAS mutation. So why is the story so interesting? Because you might know that farnazil transferase inhibitors, such as tipifernib, they were already evaluated 20 years ago as a novel RAS-directed therapy. So the idea was the following. You know that when you have mutant RAS, it must be localized at the plasma membrane to activate downstream signaling. So the idea was that with these inhibitors of farnesyl transferase, that it could delocalize RAS from the membrane, and then it could not signal down. Unfortunately, they did a lot of phase two and three clinical trials. They all failed, but very importantly, these trials were enriched with patients with NRAS and KRAS mutations. And so Craig, I will explain to you, you have three types of RAS mutations. You have KRAS, NRAS, and HRAS. HRAS is actually the less less frequent uh, mutation in RAS. What's it stand for, the H? Is it the person in line of duty, H, who's the body? Homologous. It's possible. I have no idea, actually. <laughs> it's a good question. I will look it up again so that I can present that the next time. No, you have to tell us, Eva. Come on. No, I'm the it? one asking the question. Uh, yeah, you don't know either. Hands has to look it up. I will look it up. So it seems that HRAS mutations are really dependent on this farnesylation. So this means yeah, you, the, the way that you stick it to the membrane, while KRAS and NRAS don't depend on this. So it makes sense to do a trial in HRAS mutated tumors with this farnesyl transferase inhibitor, in this case, tipifranib. So this is what the authors did. They performed a trial in head and neck why in head and neck? Because there, in about 4 to 8% of the cases, they have HRAS mutations. And response rate was the primary endpoint of the study. The drug is, in general, quite well tolerated, and but the response was 55% in heavily pretreated patients. So it's quite high. They had a PFS of 5.6 months and an OS of 15.4, but I would not focus too much on that because the sample size is quite low with only 20 patients. The responses were very rapidly and durable. And why 
is the epiphany for me so important? Because actually I have now two patients and they are not head and neck. One is an urethral cancer and the other one is a cholangiocarcinoma, which atras mutations both. And I treat them now with the epiphany and they respond really well. So I think it's something we need to explore more in the future uh, to use the epiphany in all atras mutated uh, patients. And what was the frequency of the different RAS mutations in head and neck cancer? So in head and neck, HRAS is about 4% of the NRAS. It's even more rare, I guess, in head and neck, and I have no clue about KRAS in head and neck. I think HRAS, I know it's, it's especially there in head and neck patients, and it's less frequent in other tumor types. So now I'm going to do part two of the paper that I presented back in episode 33. So if you haven't listened to that, I'd stop this potty and go and listen to that and then come back because it really is a fantastic paper. It's really a manifesto of how to do a good study versus bad. From our friend Bish in Canada, it's the paper Biases in Study Design, Implementation and Data Analysis that Distort the Appraisal of Clinical Benefit in the ESMO Magnitude of Clinical Benefit Scale. So they were looking at things that they should optimise for the next version of the scale and it goes through all the criteria of good trials and what gaps they have in the scoring system. So I'm going to pick up where I left off and they're looking at the issue of early stopping of clinical trials. Now, even with statistical rules, if you stop a trial early, your tendency is that you may overestimate the magnitude of benefit. The sooner the trial is stopped, the more impressive the hazard ratio will look because stopping criteria are more stringent early in the course of the trial. So even though you may get a positive result, the magnitude of the benefit may be exaggerated. And that's really particularly important when the primary endpoint is not our one of our definitive endpoints like OS or quality of life, but a surrogate endpoint such as PFS. However, that doesn't impact on the magnitude of clinical benefit scale, uh, so there's no shortcoming with regard to the early stopping issue. There's none either for the issue of inflated response rate and durations in single arm trials. Now we know that overall response rate and duration of response are higher in single arm trials than when the same medicine for the same indication goes into an RCT. Overall response rate is really a poor surrogate for both OS and quality of life. But the current ESMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale has two stringencies to cope with this. Firstly, a single arm study is capped at a maximum score of three and penalties are applied for adverse events. You can get an extra point if the findings are confirmed in a phase four, so a post-marketing study, or it will be cancelled if accelerated approval is subsequently withdrawn. So the conclusion is the magnitude of clinical benefit scale copes well with this issue. Let's look at the issue of a non-inferiority design. Now, why do we bother testing agents if we don't think they're going to have better efficacy? Well, it might be easier to give, it might be less expensive, there might be less adverse effects, or it may improve quality of life without necessarily changing survival. Now, the key thing is to define your non-inferiority margin, and the paper bemoans the fact that there is no standard by statistical rule defining non-inferiority. So you can really choose whichever margin you like. Um, pretty much we need to fix this uh, issue. The non-inferiority should be less than the gain observed in the superiority trials of the active comparator. So Eva, did they choose a cutoff then? Because I always see when I see non-inferiority trials, it's very difficult to say, okay, what is relevant and what is not? Is it 1.12, 1.10? What do they choose as hazard ratio? 
Exactly. I think that will be proposed for the next version of the magnitude of clinical benefit scale. But interestingly, the FDA and EMA and others, if you've got a non-inferiority scale, they want not only an intention to treat analysis, uh, they want a uh, per protocol analysis as well because of that. So now I'm going to look at two study implementation issues. The first is post-progression therapy. Now, the ICH guidelines say that we all efforts should be made to collect all data pertinent to relevant outcomes. And certainly post-progression therapy is very pertinent to an overall survival outcome from an earlier line of therapy. But as patients live longer and longer with more and more lines of therapy, this is putting large burdens on clinical trial units. Now, the illustrative case in this paper is the Mona Lisa 7 study looking at ribocyclid versus placebo as first or second line treatment of premenopausal women with estrogen positive breast cancer. The trial reported that RIBO gave a PFS gain of 10.8 months and the pre-planned interim analysis met its specified pre-specified significance threshold. And if you apply the current magnitude of clinical benefits score, the Mona Lisa 7 study gets a score of four and then the quality of life data was published and it was upgraded to five because this, there was a delayed deterioration in global quality of life. However, in the paper, it says that 26.8% of patients in the control arm and 31% of patients in the ribo arm receive no further subsequent treatments at disease progression. So you've got young women with ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer who only receive either one or two lines of therapy and then apparently get no further anti-cancer therapy. And that's just not reflective of what happens in clinical practice. And so the failure for these patients to get standard post-progression therapy, and we know median is around four subsequent lines of therapy in this population, that may well have exaggerated the overall survival gain from RIBO compared to placebo. Now, the current magnitude of clinical benefit scale does not penalise studies in which OS benefit has been exaggerated by substandard post-progression treatment. That's something that the working party uh, looking at the next version of the score is going to look at carefully. So the final one for today, and I might even take this over to the uh, third episode, that would be a record, let's see if any listeners follow us over, is publication bias in the reporting of quality of life data. So again, many trials don't even collect it, but there is also an issue with quality of life data not being published or being substantially delayed even when the primary study results are positive. And we've seen that in our clinical trial groups in Australia. It seems somehow very slow to get quality of life data put into publication and actually published. So ESMO Clinical of Benefit Scale does adjust for quality of life when it is reported but doesn't penalise if the reporting is either delayed or never makes it to publication. Again, something they're looking at fixing. Now, I'm going to leave the final two issues from this paper to our next regular episode, and I hope that our audience will follow us through, just like they will to find out what the H stands for in HRAS, who is H. Maybe we can put that on Twitter and we'll get all the Line of Duty fans coming through. Over to you, Craig, for short bites. Thank you, Eva. So my first one is from the JAMA network, and it's estimated projection of US cancer incidence and death to 2040. So it was really interesting. They're looking at, you know, some changes in time 
of cancer incidence and death. And so the notable change is a, the rise in melanoma, which they're suggesting will become the second most common cancer in the US by 2040. But a huge drop in prostate cancer, which will drop to 14th. So why would that be? Well, firstly, with melanoma, it's probably a lifestyle issue. So people are having more leisure time and sun exposure. The incidence of melanoma as people get older will rise. And through the drop in prostate cancer screening, there'll be actually a plummet in the incidence of prostate cancer. So in terms of the expected deaths by 2040, is it unfortunately something that is probably a little bit close to home for your practice, Eva and Hans, is that pancreatic cancer, liver and bile duct cancer will continue to rise and surpass colorectal cancer deaths, even though colorectal cancer will remain as one of the more common cancers. So this is there's some assumptions here that treatments may not change or new discoveries made, but nevertheless, take a message, expect a drop in prostate cancer and a quick rise in the incidence of melanoma. And my second quick bite, now that I'm no longer a dummy in liquid biopsies, I chose this one called Plasma CFDNA Genotyping in Hospitalised Patients with Suspected Metastatic Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. Hang on, we've got to put in a plug for our CTDNA special edition with fantastic guests. If you haven't listened, jump on. You can hear Craig being a dummy and you can hear Christian Rollett Foe. You can hear Lizzie Smith, all the latest. Uh, back to you, Craig. So this was using a platform called the Garden 360 looking at cell-free DNA. So I'm not sure that they don't specify the cost of that or the you know the sort of widespread use of that platform but one of the issues in non-small cell lung cancer is that you know we the patient gets a biopsy they're diagnosed and then they see the medical oncologist and they order a NGS so this was doing a blood sample in patients with suspected treatment and within three days they were able to determine the mutations in fact, whether they had lung cancer or had another cancer. So they, this is a, not a big group of patients. It was 20 patients, but they found that 68% of them had a metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and 21% had another solid tumour, so melanoma, breast cancer, spindle cell tumour. But they found in 45% of the patients an actionable mutation which could determine their first-line treatment. So. Again, following on from our liquid biopsy special, you know, I think we can see more and more in this space where we're looking to use these new technologies to guide us in the diagnosis and treatment options for these patients. Back to you, Eva. Well, Hans, did I go with you to the garden launch at the last in-person ASCO where they hired out most of the Hancock Tower and it was completely completely over the top, reminiscent of what pharma used to do and now the companies that, that don't sell drugs but they sell diagnostics. They had TV studio. They Didn't they have singing girl and dancing girls, as I recall? was was uh, pretty over the top. I don't remember that much because there were a lot of drinks as well there, if I remember right. I think you I think you particularly took advantage of the lots of drinks. Exactly. So what are your short and, bites, Hans? And a big a big shout out to Hans's family who's listening in tonight. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. They know he drinks. <laughs> so let's go to my short bites. I selected actually two. As you know, I think it in 2020 we had finally some changes in the treatment of rectal cancer. Everybody was speaking about the Rapido trial at the neoadjuvant one. But on the other hand, you also had the Prodigy 23 trial, the French trial. And uh, it has already been presented before at major conferences, but now it's finally published in uh, Lancet Oncology in April 2021 by Thierry Conroy et al. And it's called Neogen Chemo with Fulfirinox and Preoperative Chemoradio for Locally Advanced Rectal Cancer. 
So I think together with Rapidote, it might be practice changing the treatment of rectal cancer. Just to remind you, there was one group that got three months of fulfirinox, then chemo radio, and then adjuvant chemo for three months Folfox. And the other group just got standard chemo radiotherapy, followed by six months of Folfox. And the conclusion was that adding fulfirinox improved the outcome, so mainly the DFS. And also what they highlighted that there was less neurotoxicity. I don't think we are already clear where we should use this schedule. Personally, I would use it, let's say, in the very large rectal cancers, advanced rectal cancers, where you want downsizing, downstaging, whatever. That's it's it's an option to use fulfirinox in combination with or previously to chemo radiotherapy. The second short bite I selected, and actually it's something that has been published before, but now in in GCO April 2021. They published the 10-year outcome of the famous CROSS trial. So the CROSS trial is, as you know, neo-advent chemo radio plus surgery for esophageal cancer. And I think the CROSS trial changed, at least in a lot of countries, the way they treated esophageal cancer neo-advent with carboplatin in combination with paclitaxel. And the conclusion of this 10-year outcome is that the overall survival benefit persists for at least 10 years. So I think it can still remain uh, one of the standard options in the treatment of neoadjuvant uh, esophageal cancer. Yeah, that field's getting crowded, isn't it, with the adjuvant IO, refer to our last Oncology Journal Club podcast. Um, Indeed. Lots of, lots of movement there, good to see in a hard-to-treat tumour like esophageal cancer. Hence, is neoadjuvant, total neoadjuvant therapy getting any traction over in, in Belgium, in it's Europe? It's good that you ask it because I'm personally a huge fan, but I find it very difficult to convince a lot of oncologists to do so. They still want to stick to the old way of giving chemo radiotherapy. Even the short course radiotherapy is difficult to implement, adding chemotherapy on top uh, also, surgeons don't like it because then you delay the surgery a bit more. But for me, it's it's a fantastic approach to give almost the whole treatment, the total knee advent treatment before surgery. For me, it's, I think it's a concept which still needs to be adapted. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. You wonder how much of the resistance is radiation oncologists not being happy giving one week, not not five or six weeks. When I say not happy, um, maybe it's something to do with a hip pocket, not happy, certainly the way things are reimbursed in Australia. Do, is it reimbursed per fraction in Belgium as well? The same here. So it's financially more interesting to give it for five weeks than to give just one week. Now, we wouldn't be suggesting that that's why there's no conversion to total neoadjuvant, would we? But Of course I mean, not, of course not. <laughs> Seriously, there are, if you look at the reasons why trial findings aren't adopted into real world practice, there's all sorts of factors. What about in regional Australia, Craig? Uh, it gets discussed in our MD team. We've had a couple of patients, but, you know, I wouldn't say that it's become the standard of care as yet. I think people are waiting for more, more evidence. Yes, ours it gets discussed and always decided against. So oh, I'm, okay. I'm waiting for it to uh, be discussed and taken up. But I think this field will evolve over the next few years. I remember when Magic came out and neoadjuvant for, you know, gastric and gastroesophageal cancer and there was a lot of resistance as well from surgeons. So I think watch this space. You're not that old either, are you? Very old. I'm getting older every day. Eva, I was on the on the first paper of ECF versus Famtex that even predated Magic. So, actually, we should do an episode on our our first papers and our the old old papers. I think I wasn't born yet when they used Famtex in gastric cancer. Probably that's probably. Thank you, Hans, for that. And so, Eva, back to you for some quickie snap bites. Snappy snap bites. Okay, I've got another one. I like addressing women's issues. This is a great oh, again? one. Come on. No, this is a there really important again. one. The patient experience of radiotherapy for breast cancer. 
a qualitative investigation as part of the Support for All study. Now, this is authored by our very good friend Heidi Probst, who's a professor of radiation therapy, and just a plug for her interview in our Cancer Clinicians Who Get Cancer episode. She really gives a fascinating, frank and very generous discussion of her own uh, journey with cancer. And she's leading this study. So the project is aimed at developing a support bra for use during radiotherapy that can reduce normal tissue toxicity for women with larger breasts and provide accuracy, dignity, and modesty for all women. And this reports the first stage of the project, a co-design process to understand the current patient experience where no support bra or modesty device is used. Now, I'll spare you the image conjured up by when I had to do a stress echo, so running on the treadmill, and they would not let me wear my bra for no reason at all. But these things are very important for patient dignity and really patient experience at a time when women are very traumatised. And so people like Heidi doing this kind of work, I think, is absolutely fantastic. Maybe it'll develop one for patients with testicular cancer to give support during their treatment. Okay, my second short bite is a paper called Active Surveillance of Metastatic Renal Cell Carcinoma Results from a Prospective Observational Study, Mark. It was published recently in Cancer. The reason I bring it up, we do a lot of RCTs, a lot of New England publications, but this is a prospective observational studies study of patients with metastatic RCC across 46 US community and academic centres. These studies are valuable. They're real world practice. And they found that active surveillance occurs in about a third of patients in real world where the patient's got not a high volume of disease, not many symptoms, and it seems to be safe and appropriate alternative to systemic therapy in selected patients. So just a plug for using big data to inform what happens in real world practice. Very quickly, the third paper is a review I'm sort of picking up on Hans's recent interest in our our previous episode, OJC, about metabolism. This is called Targeting Metabolism to Enhance Immunotherapy, published in Cancer Immunology Research. It's a really good review if you're interested in the metabolic programs within both the cancer cell and the tumour microenvironment and what strategies we may get to in the future to manipulate this. Radio, that's me. Well done. So do you have a Twitter account of the week, Eva? Well, I like Rex Chapman. Does anyone follow Rex? He no. He does really interesting things, but he mainly really interesting and cute clips with dogs and other animals as well. So if you're a a dog fan, a pet fan, Rex Chapman, that's my Twitter account. What about you? I'm going to follow Rex, I think. Hans, how many listeners are you up to? Listeners, you mean? Um, Twitter followers. Well, are they the same number? (laughs) I have a bit more bit more Twitter followers than listeners, indeed. Yeah, how many? I'm up to 263 I'm following and 529 followers. I reckon you're more than that, Craig. I've got 505 followers, Eva, so I'm not far behind you. It's an honour to have that many, I must say. Oh, yeah. There's some great people. I love it when you follow someone, they follow you back. That's a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah, but it doesn't work for me because I have I follow 390 people and I only have 175 followers, so that is decreasing. You need to tweet. <laughs> um, you tweet in <laughs> Flemish and I can never uh, understand your tweets. That's why. 
<laughs> Look, really, Hans is a celebrity. For those of you thinking, why is he on this podcast? Who the hell is he? He's someone really important. He's a KOP in his own house. And we thank you very much, Hans. I love your analyses and your papers. See you next time. Bye bye, Eva. And thanks, bye bye, all. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Hans. And thanks to all the people who are downloading these podcasts. Rex Chapman, check it out. See you later. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au, and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.